read our history, but also that it continues to live on in our collective consciousness in the form of a metaphor. A metaphor for all that is to come. Truth, non-violence, unbounded courage, indestructible conviction, and irrepressible optimism. It is therefore our privilege to have amongst us today two very eminent speakers who will shed light on the simultaneity of that as history and as contemporary. I welcome to our midst Dr. Jacob Bulligan, Director, Gandhi Center for Rural Development and Founder Coordinator, Center for Gandhian Studies of the University of Kerala. I also welcome Professor Vishwajit Das, Founder, Director and Professor, Center for Culture, Media and Governance, Jamia Milia Islam. Deepest gratitude to Dr. Kulikan and Professor Das for joining us today. I also welcome the participants representing uh, media educators, media professionals, development professionals, researchers and students from over 50 different institutions and organizations across the length and breadth of the country who have joined us today. Before we begin, I invite uh, Professor Sunil Kanthikra, webinar director, uh, to introduce our guest speakers for today. Uh, sir, you will need to unmute yourself. Uh, Behra, sir, you will kindly need to be, uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Anjuman. And uh, I, good afternoon to you all. And I welcome you all once again to this webinar on Mahatma Gandhi, making of history and contemporary relevance. Before I introduce Professor Das and Professor Jacob Pudikan, I have something to say to all the participants. You must have seen we have uploaded two posters, where in the first poster we said that the topic of the webinar is making up uh, Mahatma Gandhi, making up history and contemporary relevance. And the second poster uh, we uploaded that says about Mahatma Gandhi making up history and contemporary. Why did we do that? When we looked at the topics of the two uh, speakers, we thought the first poster would be appropriate. Then we did some brainstorming, we all, our colleagues in the department. Then we realized that is it only Gandhiji is relevant to the, in the contemporary times? Or Gandhiji or Gandhiji's values are also shaping the contemporary time and shaping our lives even today. Then we realized that if we look at even the Pradeshi movement that is happening, that uh, uh, earlier we were boycotting uh, the English goods, the, uh, the British goods during Gandhi's times, and today we say that we must buy the Chinese goods, of course, all other goods. And we also talk about the Atmanirvar Bharat, where we have to produce a domestic production must go up. If we um, say, uh, or we will not use the Chinese products or the foreign products, then naturally our domestic production must go up. And Gandhiji's views were that in those days also, he was talking about the increase in domestic production through cottage industries. And today, fortunately for us, we do not have many cottage industries, but we are having self-help groups which have taken this task. Say, for example, the current example during the COVID times, if you look at the mask market, every state, all the self help groups in various states of the country, they have been producing masks with cultural motifs. In Assam, the Assamese gamusa is being used to uh, prepare masks. In Odisha, the Sambalpuri. In uh, Tamil Nadu, they are. This. So, it's a manifestation of our cultural roots in making the mask. At the same time, it is a domestic production of masks. So we thought it more relevant uh, that the topic should be Mahatma Gandhi making up history and also contemporary. So that is the reason why the second poster we upload. Now before I introduce again the uh, honored guests, uh, honored speakers today, I will just 
um, briefly give you some quotations given by many of the world statesmen and world leaders about our great Gandhiji. Nelson Mandela uh, talked about Gandhi. He said that Mahatma Gandhi was his greatest teacher. Gandhi's ideas have played a vital role in South Africa's transformation and with the help of Gandhi's teachings, apartheid has been overcome. And Dalai Lama, as you all know, he said, I have the greatest admiration for Mahatma Gandhi. He was a great human being with a deep understanding of human nature. His life has inspired me and will keep on inspiring the human civilization. Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader of USA, who adopted nonviolence as the weapon of choice to help millions of African Americans fight for their rights. He said, Christ gave us the goal and Mahatma Gandhi the tactics. Albert Einstein, as you know, who was a very close friend of Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, they were big admirers of each other, and they keep uh, exchanging letters frequently. Einstein called Gandhi a role model for the generations to come. He said, I believe that Gandhi's views were the most enlightened of all the political men in our times. Now we call Gandhiji as Mahatma was given to him by Rabindranath Tagore. Although Rabindranath Tagore and Gandhi had some sad differences, yet Rabindranath Tagore was the first notable contemporary to refer to Gandhi as Mahatma. He said, Mahatma Gandhi came and stood at the door of India's destitute millions. Who else had so unreservedly accepted the vast masses of the Indian people as his flesh and blood? Truth awakened truth. This is how uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, and before I start introducing our guest, I will uh, <clears throat> tell about another George Bernard Shaw. Somebody, uh, he, he, as you all know, he is a Nobel Prize winning Irish playwright and somebody uh, who asked him about Gandhi, what are his impressions on Gandhi, then he said, impressions on Gandhi? You might well ask for someone's impression on the Himalayas. He compared Gandhi with the Himalayas. So these are the uh, uh, impressions of uh, Mahatma Gandhi um, um, uh, all over the world. And he is not only a, a leader for our nation, for our freedom struggle, for our independent India, but he has spearheaded such kind of movements all over the country by influencing the leaders there. And today when we uh, have um, two most important speakers, one I will say a, a, not only a follower and believer of Gandhian values, but also a practitioner of Gandhian values. Dr. Jacob Pulikan. Dr. Jacob Pulikan did his master's, MPhil, and also PhD in Gandhian studies and Gandhian philosophy. He continued his academic uh, uh, pursuits only in Gandhian uh, philosophy and Gandhian values. And then he uh, worked as a young coordinator, youth coordinator in Gandhi Smithy and Darshan Samiti Delhi. He started his career as a youth coordinator. Then he later on became the founder coordinator of the Center for Gandhian Studies of University of Kerala, founder director of the Kerala State Gandhi Darshan Samiti, and he was awarded a lot of uh, uh, awards, awarded with the Ramchandran Ikeda International Award for Best Youth Organizer and Best Social Activist Award of the Ekta Parishad and Madras Hoena Foundation, Switzerland. He also got Gandhi Samiti, uh, Smriti Darshan Samiti's Educational Fellowship and Mumbai Chandu Memorial Trust Vadesi Fellowship. And he is now nominated in the National Committee by the Government of India to commemorate the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. He also received the first Swabalamban Award instituted by the Babuji Award Committee of Madhya Pradesh in 2018 for groundbreaking Swadeshi work in Kerala. Let me say that he is spearheading a movement known as Swadeshi Hope Movement 
product training program where he is uh, uh, training the people to prepare homemade products and become self-sufficient, which in which Gandhi believes it. And uh, he has published about nine books on Gandhian philosophy and twelve books on Swadeshi homemade products training movement, like the Gandhian movement in India, the Sarvode movement in Sri Lanka, the new international economic order, the Gandhian world order, and so many. And the most important thing for communication uh, scholars, students, and teachers, he has been instrumental in producing about 316 Gandhi Darshan episodes about Gandhi's life and philosophy and 268 episodes of Swadeshi episodes about Gandhi and Swadeshi one in television channels. So that's a great achievement, 316 channel, um, episodes on Gandhi Darshan and 268 episodes on Swadeshi uh, movement of Gandhi and Swadeshi philosophy. So uh, I am really uh, grateful um, to Dr. Jacob Kulikan and he is also popularly known as Kulikan Gandhi in Kerala and uh, many other parts of the country. So I welcome you sir uh, and I am grateful that you have given us time to speak on the relevance of Gandhi in 21st century. Now regarding our, <clears throat> the other eminent speaker, uh, Professor Biswajit Das, a very good friend of mine, he is a very senior academician for the last three decades and he started, um, the, he is the founding director uh, and professor of the Center for Culture, Media and Governance of Jamia Milia Islamia and you must be knowing Jamia Milia Islamia has been uh, rated as the best central university uh, by the government, by the MSRD for this year. Uh, so congratulations, Mr. Vajit Bab. And Professor Das expertise and as an uh, academician and researcher, he leads the field in policy research. And he also leads the field in method and history of communication in India. Prior to joining the center of uh, Jamia Milia, he, was, he worked with national and international agencies conducting communication research and training. And Dr. Das has been a visiting professor also at York University, Toronto, South Korea, and fellow at the University of Windsor, Canada, fellow at MSH Paris, Inalco Paris, and Charles Wallace Trust, London, and also the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla, in India. He has been a member of Innovation Council of INB Ministry, Government of India, and member to monitor media related courses in the country. Been in the advisory board of, you know, um, of Consortium of Education Communication, New Delhi, and National Council for Rural Institute, and several other distinguished bodies such as UDC, ICSSR, and Councils of Government of India. And his research basically they, they are supported by many international funding agencies. He has been able to rope in. Uh, because of his quality research, he has been able to rope in many international funding agencies and he were, his research was supported by indo French Scholarship, Sastri Indo-Canadian Institute, Charles Wallace India Trust, Ford Foundation, SSRC New York, UNESCO, UNDP, IDRC, UGC, ICSSR and Hivos Netherlands. He is the co-author of the SAID series and communication process and he has published Media and Mediation and another book, The Social and the Symbolic. And the third work on communication series that is Culture and Confrontation in 2010. His recent book on Gandhian Thoughts and Communication is published by Sage in 2020. Dr. Das has also published several research articles in international and national journals. He is
think Professor Uh, sorry, there was uh, some technical glitch and uh, Professor Das, I welcome you again and I welcome Dr. Jacob Pulikan and Professor Das to this semi webinar today. Now Anjuman. Thank you so much, Professor Behra, for introducing our uh, speakers for today. And I'm sure after listening to this, everyone is eagerly awaiting uh, for the talks to begin. So, without much delay, I would like to first uh, invite Dr. Uh, Jacob Pulikan to kindly deliver his uh, talk titled Contemporary Relevance of Gandhi. Dr. Pulikan. Dr. Pulikan. Yeah. Clear respected. Sunil Behra. Professor Vishwit Das. Professor of teachers, students, and other people who are listening. First, I should say that. I am extremely happy to be with you. Especially on this Independence Day. Wishing, wishing you all with a greeting of greetings of Independence Day. While talking about Gandhi and Gandhian philosophy with its relevance. Before going into the subject, I should narrate some of the things happening in the country. We are nearing the completion of the 150th anniversary commemoration celebration programs. It was a two-year program. And during the first year, it was a lesson year. And during the second year, this is a corona year, COVID year. Anyway, fortunately or unfortunately, nothing has happened except the establishment of a most powerful committee, national committee. The 124 members committee comprising with the President of India, Vice President of India, Prime Minister of India, and eight cabinet ministers. All the former Prime Ministers, of, all the former Supreme Court Chief Justices, all the Chief Ministers, and we should, we should, we can easily see that At the time of the second sitting of the committee in last year, I mentioned the matter before the committee that nothing has happened just because the first year was election year. And a racial series in Dingo planning and implementing some important activities. And I made a, I made two proposals in front of the committee. The first proposal is implementing the Gandhi Darshan program in all the schools of the country that the young minds, our, our young children, from the first standard to the twelfth standard. And therefore, with the college students in the national service scheme, registered with the national service scheme and the Gandhi Darshan program throughout the country. 
and the, the second proposal I made in the committee is starting of the or setting up of the homemade industries department. And that was a note in the government sector, it's a semi government sector. We all know that some if we are organizing something in the government sector, it will be fucked up your time. For correcting the people, especially the poor and the out of people, we should do a semi type organization by collaborating with the NGOs. And I, I made a special mention that I am not talking about the Fortagen Village Industries. The Fortagen Village Industries is having a separate section department in the ministry. But for homemade Sudeshi products, nothing has happened in the country so far. Mahatma Gandhi wrote, wrote his fundamental book in 1909, The Hindu Suraj. Hindu Suraj is the central idea is Suraj. And for attaining the Suraj, the weapons Gandhi put forward before the people of his country is not very Satyagraha. And after the attainment of the freedom, Gandhi put forward an important program that is the constitutive program and through the constitutive program your Sodeshi program. So I put before the committee this is the background. We should think about the poor people. Do something do something for the each and everybody who is doing something by sitting in their own home. But nothing happened at the national level, the committee's level. So far, nothing, nothing happened and then nothing is going to happen also. So I purposefully mentioned this is what is going on in our country, the Mahatma's land. We consider Mahatma Gandhi as the father of the nation, a saint leader of the freedom, the architect of the freedom of the country. But it is our consideration. What is the people around the world viewing and seeing Mahatma Gandhi not as the father of father of India, India's father of the father, or is the architect of India's freedom? They are considering and viewing Mahatma Gandhi as the father of the modern peace movement. Mahatma Gandhi put before the well, put before the humanity. The non-violent method of fighting against injustices and that influence in the whole world and they consider him as the father as the father of the modern peace movement. And on the second count, those people who are engaging the ecological movement, they consider Mahatma Gandhi as the father of the modern ecological movement. And we should understand that that also during Mahatma Gandhi's I, there is no way such ecology or uh, environment. So, given that type, he did a lot of things for, for the preservation of ecology and he made focus for the nature's development and this type of things. And on the third count, there is a series of attempts to view 
Mahalma Gandhi as the father of the modern medicine. That is going to be a new or a, going to be a, a, an astonishing news for the, for the people of India. Gandhi is viewed increasingly viewed as the mother of the modern medicine. <coughs> and, but much of the people there do not know anything about Gandhi himself was practicing a a naturopathy doctor in his, during his lifetime. And about one third of the writings and about one third of all his activities, the naturopathy, vegetarianism, and natural living, this type of activities. And now, there is a modern trend that Gandhi is going to be viewed as Gandhi is viewed as the father of modern management concerns. And by hearing this news, every day will be totally having a, a strange look. Gandhi, Gandhi, is, Gandhi is, a, is a father of the modern management. Totally Gandhi is the biggest, is the number one person humanity has seen. In managing the Gandhi has a, has a astonishing capability of managing people, managing situations, and automating the situation. He is the most, most powerful man humanity has ever seen. In tackling human situations in care, in tackling Contrary situations and bringing peace and normalcy wherever part of every other situation. So he is the biggest management and in the surprise of everybody. Now people are managed as pets and rising Gandhi's concept of trusteeship as the model of number one model of management and Gandhi's management strategy. So this is what I wanted to I am Ayin, I am Yirin Gandhi in two different levels. One is on the theoretical level and the second one is on the practical level. Maybe I got my postgraduate in in a comments. I am basically I am a comments man. Later, I, I said to Gandhi studies and uh, did get my Gandhi philosophy and uh, get filled in Gandhi philosophy and did my doctor program about the Gandhi movement. And certainly, uh, I could have a, an inclination going towards the side of the theoretical advancement activities and uh, way of thinking. But I purposefully selected for the other way. The practical aspects of Gandhian philosophy. So, I will be focusing on one aspect, the theoretical level and how the theoretical level of Gandhi's Gandhian philosophy is superior to all the other philosophies that humanity has seen over the time. We all know that the beginning of the beginning of all theories is Darwin's survival of the fetus. Is uh, the Lysif philosophy that is the perfect competition. The third theory is a utilitarian theory. It says that in the, major, in the welfare of the majority is happening, everything is all right. So it counts only the welfare of the majority and welfare of the, uh, the minority in this, uh, in this regards. That, that means 51 percent of the people counted and 49 percent neglected. 
when we are when we are coming to our own democratic setup, even 20 percent or 25 percent is counted as the 75 percent or up to 80 percent neglect. That is the rest theory comes. Huxley's theory: leave and let leave. We have seen that the signal boards by the side of the national highways. Leave and let leave, and nothing else happened. That is a later report against theory, the Russian said, Arabic state. Later to report this theory, the theory of mutual aid. In that theory, he stressed the need for adopting a lifestyle of helping mentality. to leave and be it counting with a hundred percent of the population, not neglecting anybody. So that is a superiority of Gandhian philosophy, the Gandhian theory, and uh, no other theories in the world is going to happen superior to Gandhi's theory. So Gandhi is Gandhi was superior, he is superior, and uh, will, will be the superior theory. That is on the theoretical level. Then coming to the practical level, the development aspects. When we say, when we look, when we study about the development factors, we can see that development of the rich people, development of, the, development of those who are having everything. Is easily counter. The development of the poor in India. The 50 percent of the population is the rich population coming and narrowing down to 5 percent. And Ambani is going to be the biggest in the, in the capitals in the world. That, that also through the aspects of the 99 percent of the population of the country. So that is the development model that we people in India we are adopting. All the ruling parties, all the all the political parties, and all the bureaucrats, everybody, everybody is one and the same. And the, and the suffering people's law is going to be worse and worse and getting poorer and poorer. So in that way, to be what what Mahatma Gandhi. As advocated. He advocated that there should be a balance between our attitude, balance between in the, in the cities and the rural areas, balance between men and environment, balance between technological factors, and even distribution of balance so, also. So, a, a five level mark. Balance in technology and the advocate for the sustainable development of the country. Not only to India, but also but it applies everywhere in the world. The first of 
for every type of development if you want it to be sustainable there should be a philosophical balance a balance between the material well-being and the moral well-being how it can be happened it can be happened through the optimization of the human funds we should think about that this is not necessary for my my life whatever is needed whatever is necessary for a for an individual's life that, that is that he 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 actually did on the second round is the second principle advocated by mahatma gandhi is a structural balance the structural balance is nothing but there should be a balance in the in the big cities of country and the rural villages of country the cities should not be developed at the expense of the poor villages so there should be a proper balance the train down there should be a balance between way and the nature by like ecological balance and in the fourth front there should be a balance between the technology the big sector technology is that we are adopting and we are using and also the the relay level appropriate technology certainly there will be there there may not there will may not be any doubt about it anybody that's the technology that is needed in a in a village is entirely different from the technology that is implemented or needed in the big cities or in big industries we need technology for rural development and also technology for the urban development or big city development but we should not be at the expense of the rural development of technology the appropriate technology and the on the final fifth round that is again that there should be a distribution balance the rich and the poor there should be balance between the rich and the poor there should be balance between the weak and the strong there should be balance between the people those who are having everything and the people those who are having nothing that is that is Thing that is going on, going on in our country. The people those who are having something, they are getting more and more and getting everything. And the people those who are living in the poor condition, they are getting lesser and lesser, and they are getting life miserable day by day. So what are those that we are looking at? Is that is that the stage part of the principle? He was not advocating or anticipating the property of the country. Those who are living in the property are an issue that will be anticipated. Or he he was not advocating the killing of the rich people or the giving the money to the poor or the oppressing the poor people. And he is not. And we get it from the progressive taxation that we we have we have been seeing in the capitalist countries. Our democratic country we are we are uh, doing the same thing with the progressive taxation, but that is not properly doing. That is that is the thing. And uh, he advocated the rich people that did not be uh, that did not. We have we have the we have the right for the property ownership. He he didn't ask for the rich people. He is that he asked the rich people to be the trustees of all their property. They are free to take whatever they actually need and utilize the balance of the money for the welfare of the other people, the poor people. That I think that is that is going to to be the biggest. Management theory, because economic theory, because development theory, that is going to be happening. If it is implemented, the 
after the ventilation system that is advocated by the by the people. I think that is going to be a, a, a new event in the in the history of uh, uh, life life system. I just mentioned about Arthur Gandhi, that's all. And, uh, after going all this type of development and budget, what we are going to what, what? the development strategy and uh, what is the development strategy and what form the development strategy and it is uh, for, for whom is the development strategy and uh, how the development strategy is happening in the country. Anybody can easily say that it is meant for those who are living in the upper conditions, uh, about 5% or 10% of the people and the rest of the 90% of the people left for Nothing. That is not the, the uh, development policy that should be implemented in the country. The, especially the land of Madhya There, the philosophy has also seen coming. That is why I started the Sadashi movement in Kerala. Basically, I decided that there should be a distinction between the water industry and the Sudeshi mode of the production. Water industry is somewhat in some way economically viable by the OCD, some equipment, some machinery, something that type, that type of things. Capital investment that even though it is in a lesser quantity, we stayed about but regarding the Sodeshi mode of production, Sodeshi industry, we do not need a capital at all. Anybody is interested, anybody is willing, he can produce his own daily wants by sitting in his own power. For that purpose, we started first in the, in the, in the soap making activity. All the, way, all the basics of IT. Items. The toilet soap, washi soap, bigger than powder, digital powder, and very lost. All these things we started giving training to the people and giving all the kids support to the people, giving quality checking and banking, check, banking support and giving the president to the market support. And so far, we, we have more after 22, 23 years of our experience. We are still underlying the fundamental principle that the marketing strategy should be adopted for marketing and it should not be so marketing. And if I am producing something, I should distribute the products to the to buy your day by the houses. And if, if I am going to be a big manufacturer, I may be producing products for me, the best Pandaya, best village, or the or, or the best district or the best state. Then the definition of the basic product actually itself is going to be changed. When you, we, are, we are going to practice in the same thing, in the, in the same way that another companies are doing. Other companies are doing in our country. Oh, what's it? Yes, yeah, the plant location, the particular place in our country. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ma mass yeah. level production, mass level production. Mm -hmm. And you're distributing all the products from that production locality through the entire country. Mm -hmm. We are simply, that is that production and distribution strategy we are adopting in the, in the house. Mm -hmm. Actually, the house and is distributing in the nearby houses. Yeah. And uh, this method is primarily meant for the self sustainment of the self reliance of the people 
of that village. And all the, in all the villages, in all the panchayats, we have started the training program. And they are doing the same thing in all the panchayats and the each and every panchayat. They have taken the responsibility of producing with the most basic, most important basic consumer item of the daily need. About 26 percent of the market is is captured by Sodeshi. The government producing people that captured from the multinational company. About 26 percent of the product products. And from there, that, that was the starting point. Then we started to almost all the items that the people the people can produce in their own houses. All the sports items that we need, we are we are producing in our own houses. All the food items we needed, we are producing in our own houses. In some of the in some of the consumer items that can be produced in the in the in the individual houses, that also we started producing. Except the the food and other except the, the rice and other items we are we are very short and kind of people we are very short of rice and other things. Except this type of activities here, all the other items. I am very sure that people can manage by themselves. And they need not go to the uh, to the big supermarkets or type of markets for these type of things. And they will be assured with the quality of the products also. The, the biggest danger that we are facing is the poisoning of, of all the items that we are consuming. We are all consuming poisonous items in, in our country that in the, in the, in the Pepsi Cola, I don't know Pepsi Cola, from, from the Pepsi Cola level to the item that our own people are producing. Not, alone, not allowed in the multinational companies. So we come to the conclusion that if some support is ready to be given by the government and the, the government itself, I am not talking about the money, monetary support, but we do not want any monetary support at all. I am 100% correct is to say that my organization. The Gandhi Center for the World Development and its Mandate Solution. So far, after the existence of 23 years, we never accepted any grants, any donation from anybody. It's a self supporting organization. So long we are not able to continue our activities by our own legs. I am decided to, to dissolve the organization by saying that. People do not want this organization. Whenever this organization should survive, otherwise, there is no need of any supporting survival. So, they, so this is a practical aspect of what is going on. The practicing side of the Gandhian philosophy. We are always talking about the military side that Gandhi is too big and Gandhi is too uh, modern for everybody, not only for India, for the whole world. But at the same time, we are not ready to practice the simple, the simplest things what Mahatma Gandhi prayed and advocated. Mahatma Gandhi was not a theoretical man. He did his theory, developed his theory, after practicing everything from practicing side to the theoretical level. So that is the difference between a theoretician and a practitioner. Gandhi is a practitioner, Gandhi developed his theories after his practicing, he become understand that it is 100% workable model. Then he attacked the people that, but unfortunately, the people who served Gandhi, 
They didn't understand the, the relevance of, of what Gandhi said and what Gandhi did. I am going to, uh, to narrate an example. Look at the case of the, look at the case of the San Santegra movement. The San Santegra movement in the San Santegra is the biggest movement in the history of India, which is played a crucial role in India's political struggle. When Gandhi selected his weapon with a sign, all of his followers, including Jamala, Nehru, Pontla, Nehru, and all the important partners, leaders of the country, they rejected that Gandhi is going, going, going to do something absurd. When Gandhi took the salt as his weapon and he implemented the salt, salt took salt at the Delhi, he saw. The, the people, the, the common people of the country, they bowed into the side of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi got so much support from the common people of the country that it just because Gandhi touched in the material that the common in the poor people of India is consuming. Nobody can survive without salt. So that intelligence, that production, the capacity Gandhi is having, and that is that's the capacity that we people in India is like, and that is why that we are talking really that the Gandhi philosophy is not a, it is not a working model, and it is not practical just because of that thinking. Okay, and nothing as and I myself. I find it very possible that when I came back from Delhi to, to the Kerala University and attended the, attended the Department of uh, the Center for Gandhi Studies of the University, I found it extremely difficult to conduct a seminar or, a, or, or a, a, a Gandhi Studies meeting for collecting 25 patients. It was a big effort during that time. Then I immediately decided that I should not waste my time by, by or collecting 25 patients, uh, spending uh, two weeks time uh, of my previous time. I, I decided that I should not, not uh, going to conduct this type of center, police center activities. Instead, I am going on the other way. I started going to the people's side, the, the NGO side, the student side, the JJ side, and I started <coughs> the training programs, and from one training program to the second year, now we are having 50 training programs. And now, I have the capacity to, to collect even 10,000 or, or 50,000 people within it. Within a day's notice, within a day's notice, that much, that, that much confidence I am having now with the starting the Gambian other city model of development activities in Kerala. And uh, that is why I am getting that much importance in the country. I, I, I want the selection of the National Committee, the other International Committee. Just because I am not, I am not a big man. I am, I am, I am not a big contributor in the country. It's just because of my sadhguru contribution that I am well aware of it. And uh, this is, this is a uh, relevance of Gandhi philosophy when we are properly implemented. So thank you very much for giving an opportunity to come to your side. Come to that so, Central University. Last year, I had the occasion uh, to receive the Guwahati for presenting the development model in front of the NGOs and other people 
and that is on a seminar organized so it will be what's up and nice by the thank you foundation so mega university also i had the chance to work with mega university the site sir technology university of bengali so this is the third time i had the chance to meet with the north is a university people and uh, Really and especially I am dying also Srimbara and also Das and I don't get that from the world voice we are going to be very good friends and we are going to collaborate with each other perspectives from intellectual history. But before that, I would also like to confess that I'm not a Gandhi. My entry to understand Gandhi probably is a very adventurous, or maybe later on it became extremely scholarly. But I began with the idea as a child, I grew with reading 
my experiment with fruit, probably there are different versions and interpretations within the scholarly world. As one school of thought would say that the term experiment itself is a Gandhi probably is the first policy scientist in the country, a kind of policy scientist when he writes in his experiment of truth about playing in Bihar and people died in Bihar and it is a kind of curse and that is a kind of a scientist Gandhi was. Anyway, there are different versions and interpretations. Others who probably talk about but the Yatra, that's also in a way styles of walking. It's how we walk, it's how Gandhi is sort of not even romanticized about styles of walking. So, but the Yatra is another interesting way. Third thing, a lot of people talk about the wonderful uh, Satyagraha Yatras. Probably, a lot of people have no clarity. What is the distinction between Satyagraha and Dura? For your information, Gandhi did Satyagrahas within his own country. But Duragraha as a term which was always used when you had any kind of opposition to the foreign powers. So we must be very clear about that we talk about Satyagraha. Anyway, my concern here is when I began my understanding about Gandhi, probably when I was a social anthropologist studying on media, when I visited the remote parts of India, and I go to every public officers, and behind every officer's desk, we find a Gandhi's frame. Gandhi so I was amazed to see Gandhi's frame. So I was probably across length and breadth of the country. And I was watching at the frames of Gandhi. In some frames, Gandhi was extremely a cheerful mood. In some, he was extremely looking absolutely uh, angry, annoyed. So I was interested in looking at the semiotics and probably how these frames are made. And that also made me a way to understand how it's kind of a one whole, uh, it, it's called as in a semantics, how it is a semiotic science, how it is a kind of a, a how you look at such kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's a flaw, which is the way in a Baudili term I was using, using and coming and by I take more of uh, that is where I sort of try to get down these posters and down these posters and frames and through this sort of trying to However, I will begin with this idea. Here I would like to talk about what is actually intellectual history and how intellectual history can offer to the field of communication. Let me clarify at the outset that intellectual history is the study of intellectuals and in ideas and intellectual patterns over time. It is, of course, different from the history of ideas. I mean, how do I make a distinction when I say it is different from the history of ideas? For instance, when I say, how do we define communication? Now, more or less, when we talk about communication, since we all talk about communication as a polysemic means, then multiple means. I mean, as some of you say, it is a circulation of ideas, some of you say exchange of ideas, some of you would say articulation of social relations, and some of you would also say transmission of ideas. I mean, each of these terms have a check in history. As historians, you know that as historians, when we talk about uh, uh, any, any engagement uh, and kind of ideas, I mean, the historian of ideas, we have to analyze the historical narratives around one major life. In, in fact, suppose I want to work on let's say for expression of idea, then I would focus exclusively on transmission of idea. When from the term transmission of idea came, then I would probably go to look at how the whole political geography, how the idea transmission is a And that is where you find that as a divine teacher says that we don't need to travel anymore to communicate rather of your ideas and travel a scheme and magnet right? So that is where steam engine and then the computer and immensely up with us. But that's also in a way it moved away from transportation. That's a medieval notion and a lot of it not come up to transmission. So that's where the table where transmission lines came. So the whole political geography transformed and changed about the understanding, engaging with the idea of So as a historian of ideas, I would be more exclusively focused to look at you know, each concept 
and then I would like to see in what way the transformation is. But when you say, when I say intellectual history, I mean, on the contrary, it is often considered to be different from history of ideas. It tends to regard ideas as historically conditioned features of the world, which are best understood within some larger context, whether it be context of social struggle, and institutional change, intellectual biography, or some larger context of cultural or even linguistic disposition, or even what you call discourses. I mean, studying intellectual history probably would help us to analyze and critique the narratives and Western theories that have constrained scholarship and initiated against the interrogation of ideas and their purposes within India in the field of communication. I mean, in fact, studying intellectual history compels scholars to take cognizance of a very wider range of methods, texts, and actors, I mean, than any established canon of Western political thought would permit. I mean, it examines how those ideas uh, uh, are received, reinterpreted uh, by India's intelligentsia in the light of its own intellectual history. I mean, as we know that information and ideas have traveled along complex routes, I mean, service by the newsletters, runners, I mean, our, uh, petition writers, and information specialists of various sorts in Indian society. If you go back and go back to this. I mean, the, the spread of, in, in fact, the lithographic press and the rise of newspaper and book publishing, I mean, intensified what you call the dynamism of information dissemination in the subcontinent. I mean, well, it is from newspapers and ephemera rather than merely from what we call the canonical text of thinkers that we can also reconstruct an Indian intellectual history. My, my presentation in that sense basically attempts to provide a very pathway in the field of intellectual history of communication. As we know that currently, the field remains in a state of fudginess in Indian communication studies. The flow and impact of knowledge in communication in Indian academia clearly reflects a bias of North American and European scholarships. Although they have made a definite impact, rarely there has been an attempt to engage with Indian intellectuals, thinkers, and scholars whose ideas could uh, potentially inform communication study in society. And this is the context which sets the tone, like we can say, for an extension of the term communication. I mean, it requires the identification of new areas of communication activity that also need to open up, as well as the invention of new ways of instituting the idea. For a long time, many independent researchers, thinkers, collectives, engage in a combined perspective of research um, and action and taking a direct part in any new social and political movements. I mean, these contributions have helped fill the new gaps left by the whole institutional or academic research and have opened new fields of investigation. In fact, what I uh, Quickly, I would like to say that all the ideas came outside the universe. You look at all the history of all intellectuals, it is they who have contributed to the science or anywhere. For that matter, I mean, I mean our, in, our insensitivity to such contributions have rather obtruded a, I an mean, expansion of mental relations and scholarship, I mean, and, and undermined indigenous potential in enriching the scholarship. I mean, a perennial question. One witnesses why teaching communication studies in India. I mean, is communication an alien force or an indigenous product? I mean, since no society can exist without communication, then the question arises what are the indigenous knowledge system, concepts, and who are the intellectuals contributed to the growth of such communication of ideas? I mean, often one can identify so many scholars starting from Vivekananda. I mean, Tagore, Gandhi, Diller, Kule, Kule, a few, probably more work needs to be done in the future years. In the, I mean, in the present context, I would rather like to focus on Gandhi and his writing. I mean, revisiting Gandhian writings is full of possibilities and promise in the realm of communication studies. Where does one locate his contributions in terms of theory and method? Gandhi was not a theoretician. He did not consciously construct a blueprint 
either theory or an ideal source for them. We often say that his life was his message. I mean, this implies that Gandhi's ideas and ideals were not codified at one place in the form of a doctrine, but were diffused in the form of his activities. One has to expand, extrapolate his ideas and ideology from an assembler of his actions. Gandhi was no Marx, and he did not leave behind an exclusive. We know Gandhi and Manifesto, but that we can use today to identify his theory and vision. Gandhi did leave behind many decades of political and social activities. Gandhi himself said that anyone we seem to follow him. After he was dead and gone, so simply look at what he did and how he did it rather than look for any well codified document. I mean, conventional studies in social sciences and communication are premised on Western enlightenment and rationality. I mean, critiques contextualize Gandhi writings with a very narrow confine of modernities celebration of scientific, scientific and technological progress in society. I mean, these, assemb these assumptions were unacceptable for Gandhi. Gandhi, for his writings, made a trenchant critique of enlightenment premise of the philosophy of progress through instrumental modernity. Gandhi felt such a progress undermined and displaced cultural values and faith from its technologies of inquiry and constructed a new social order around modern relations overseen by a secular state. When we read Gandhi, we are moved by his texts, not just by iconic texts such as King Suraj or his autobiography, but by his numerous writings, correspondences, and short letters. Gandhi was metaphorical. He knew how to use the language. He was an experimenter with an idiomatic vernacular expression of language. Gandhi, as a communicator, uh, was extremely transparent and straightforward, and he spoke through multiple platforms. Gandhi was earnest enough to admit that what I say now is what applies. What I said earlier is not true anymore, because I have done some thinking since then. This statement clearly reveals Gandhi is a thinking mind with a deeper purpose behind every act of language. However, a communication perspective needs to address several facets, even in stances where Gandhi did not succeed as a communicator. There are also occasions where Gandhi's communication was successful because others around him made it successful or possible. I mean, what is equally important is the perception. I mean, this perception refers to a kind of what you call an aesthetic uh, a dimension that Gandhi was continuously referring to behind each of his communicated action. This is especially true for the matter in which Gandhi selectively would go that created um, elements from Hindu mythology in a way to communicate with the larger public sphere. Besides Gandhi's own act of uh, uh, communication, he organized. Uh, Gandhi Katha. Stories narrated about Gandhi in groups and gatherings that were part real and part derived from his body of work. Gandhi's communication is not only what he said, but also the reception, its interpretation, its reinterpretation, its creative interpretation, and its strong interpretation. I and mean, then they together constitute the Gandhian perspective of communication. I mean, in Gandhian thought, the power of a symbol is not independent of the truth of the message. Further, for Gandhi, the medium as the message was diametrically opposite to the manner in which it was enunciated by Pulitol Marx and I mean, in the Gandhian point of view, the message is not independent. Not every medium can carry every message. The medium is not neutral in the sense of truth and truthfulness. Critiques have not their way to imagination, metaphor, and the use of symbolic and cultural resources that Gandhian writings and practice can carry with it. Culture of Gandhi is an activity, a productive activity, 
something similar to labor in Marx's own words, which produces and reproduces, if not commodities in that sense, but a way of life, a model of life, which enables to critique, to create, uh, recreate, realize, and therefore transform. I mean, culture of Gandhi is a set of symbols, experiences, signs grounded in the real world. I mean, culture for it wrestle the naked realities of life. Now, the used language, not in a very strictly formal instrumental sense, but for him, being a linguistic being, uh, Gandhi engaged intensively with the language question throughout his life, not only with respect to English language versus Indian language, but with respect to what should be the language of country like India. The language for him was a break of culture, of civilization. Uh, uh, civilization for him was not simply in terms of West and East civilizations, but also a question of modernity. What Gandhi brings to bear in this very unusual little booklet that is called In Swaraj is to say that the very basis of value which modernity proposes sits on a hollow ground. I mean, in Gandhi's In Swaraj, the word Western civilization is used not in an ethnic sense, but to explain the modern West. It's a marker of what to Europe in its transformation to modernity a transformation of a phenomenal and remarkable order. In fact, the success, the reach, and the depth of the transformation are such that not just the small confinement called Europe sacked the world in terms of power, but the very modes of thinking, the very modes of foundation, language itself. I mean, the relationship of that language with the spoken language of ordinary life, the claims of the bridge language is not just an arbiter of our excellence, but, very, uh, but about the very uh, possibility of a meaningful thought. In the past, it was possible to have a classical languages with enormous each and reach and power, but they never in any part of the world would, with some exception, displace the natural vigor and resonance of the spoken language. Uh, the fundamental argument of Hind Swaraj is that the locus of that and modernity is shifted out of the human locus into the world of things. And therefore, the modern quest which begins as a quest to make man as the measure of things, has become things as the measure of man. It has been reversed, and that's the paradox that Gandhi was addressing. And the word uses for the way out of this Suraj, which is a most interesting word, expression, and concept. I and mean, there are three elements of the word Swaraj. One, Swa, here refers to the individuals, the little life that is given to all of us, but with a profound sense of completeness. And the Swa of the connection, social and political ultia, but this little Swa, in its littleness, rests on the infinity of an interior life that never be without transcending cosmic reference from whence arise both the sense of loneliness and the quest to transcend and the power to question our own principles, markers of identity, even in the moment of most critical Gandhian ideas cannot be grasped by applying fixed categories and traditional philosophical assumptions. Second categories plucked out of literary theory do not convey an overall sense of what Gandhi actually stood for. Finally, his entire world view has to be located in the proper historic context. Gandhi was a prolific writer, wrote and spoke always in context and according to the demands of the situation. As you perceive, Gandhi did not use the word modernity to address the realities of contemporary modern life. He was a great political strategist and his dialectic is also strategy. I mean, he preferred uh, all the notions of uh, modern civilization to analyze the hard facts that colonial people were facing in India. By talking about civilization, he focused on the negative aspects of modern civilization. And he often made it synonymous with Western civilization. Gandhi was convinced while writing in Swaraj that the chief driving force of Western societies is imperialistic 
and its principal agenda for the colonized is to exploit the wealth of other resources from colonial lands for the benefits of the best. Gandhi's emphasis on the negative features of modern civilization has another concrete context. I mean, he was aware of the fact that many Indian expatriates in modern language were in the hypnotic grip of what we call the old very westernized wisdom that was not good for the welfare of humanity in general, and India in particular. Most of the expatriates were patriots in spirit, but their patriotism was limited and constrained due to their wrong political understanding. I mean, expatriate Indians were like laws of individual heroic action uh, that had the potential of inflicting violence. Uh, he found this ironically similar to the violent nature of the colonial state activists when it came to dealing with a lot of the subjugated I mean, there was uh, yet, I mean, Another irony that we did in the botanist world of the expatriate uh, Indians, I mean, they hated British official, but loved the system designated by them. Design, sorry, design. I mean, they also did not understand the real nature of the humans. Gandhi, during the South African period, had realized and personally experienced many cases of imperialistic accesses. He also saw the real face of the proponents of Gandhi through Hitswara's trying to interpret the hegemonic power of the colonial state over the minds of intellectuals and subjugated masses. While explaining the issues of nationalism, Gandhi understood the necessity of ground political work and lauded the thoughtful intervention of early nationalists. He called the other way analogy the father of Indian nationalism, who profoundly expressed in Hitswara's that religion is a personal matter, and in fact, there are as many religions as human mind in this world. Religion cannot be the basis of nationalism of any kind. One should not try to mix the cultural notions of colonialism or some other identity with nationalism just to undermine um, its very positive historic, historical value. Gandhi was of the view that Indians should contribute to the overall target of world civilization and the problems faced by the world in a manner that reflected those. I mean, at various points in time, to reaffirm his faith in him for us. I mean, there are three possible reasons for it. First, Gandhi, during the course of the national movement, did develop an instrumentalist relationship with modern technology. He used it, but without really becoming the slave of it, he did see the total capacity of modern civilization to capture the minds and the hearts of the people. Gandhi did not want to deprive himself and the movement and the people around them of the advantages of the technology. Second, Gandhi's political life was actually a series of many failures and disappointments and frustrations. Chorichara was one disappointment. Roger Satyagraha, holding firm to truth, was very successful, was not very successful, but the education. With the Congress to do some screening, he wanted to make screening a compulsory part of Congress activities. Finding that these were not so many, there were not so many takers, he eventually gave it up in 1922. Therefore, Hinsuraj provided a kind of psychological push for him in the face of failures and setbacks. The third reason is related to the nature of modernity itself. Although the economic, political, and social I mean, one the superiority uh, of modernity is not, not in doubt. It was seen as a morally reckless. The sources of morality tend to dry up. I mean, a hectically mobile, egalitarian, instrumentalist society finds it generally hard to generate moral resources. I mean, in Gandhi's search for morality, King Swaraj became a mental signpost. King Swaraj served exactly that purpose. Gandhi had selected a creation of modern technology. In his debate with Nehru uh, in 1945, when Nehru argued that villages were a backward place and the villager is insular, uh, uh, villages are insular and obscurantes, Gandhi retorted, uh, the Indian villages lives in my mind. I am allowed to imagine and my village will consist of intelligent 
man and woman, in practice, hygiene, cleanliness, etc. What Gandhi talked about was not the existential limits. Gandhi here is perhaps marking a distinction between historical fact and the immense possibilities that lie in I mean, Gandhi's use of symbolic resources is phenomenal. I mean, he termed worker struggle as a million, one may call it a religious struggle, it was, but it was not a religious struggle. In that sense, it was dharma. For Gandhi, again, was a very polysemic word, where language was employed in a non traditional sense. Gandhi advised workers to remain from a uh, firm in their commitment to strike. For in Satyagraha, it's a struggle where resting the best wins. One's honor and dignity. It's a Maharashtra case. I mean, Gandhi told workers not to rely on finances from outside to survive during the course of the story. And that work and work is, is and work is very important. And a few relations to learn from this experience, Gandhi interpreted the strike as a moral struggle against injustice. I mean, he placed it in the context of the global struggle, not only in India, but the world over including South Africa, where Gandhi had a first-hand experience of successful W. I mean, Gandhi wanted the striking workers to act as Satyagrahis who would be prepared to suffer for the achievement of justice, and there should be no ill will against the real owners. He told workers to earn their living by working in the period of the strike and not to depend on the contributions of the sympathizers. Uh, this, I mean, according to him, amounted to role and would end up with degrading workers in the eyes of their employers and others. Gandhi sought to maintain a balance between the interests of both the parties so that none would claim victory, which would obviate lasting bitterness between them. When his retrospective assessment of strike was positive, but it ultimately restored a pretty cool faith among the, the workers and taught them to remain stay fast. I mean, in the face of adversity. I mean, there was a partial, this was actually a partial failure of communication as the idea which Gandhi wished to convey to the workers, as well as to be owners who had not fully carried through certain methods of communication employed by Gandhi were quite new in fact. I mean, although, I mean, these new channels uh, widened his reach, there was to convey also had such a nobility so far as the conduct of their strike is concerned. The women, I mean, what you call the biological as well as secular imagery, the invoked was not easy to grasp it, the mundane and conflict in the world of living relations. But now we can say that his conception of the subjects was quite new and inclusive and in a way it remained so until the end, at least for the majority. I mean, certain communication failure was built in the polysemic nature of Gandhi's various concepts. It does not mean, however, that it was a total failure. I mean, given the challenges he faced in his political career, Gandhi was constantly looking for a better and more effective methods of communication all the time. I mean, Congress leaders in their agitations, I mean, um, sorry, uh, I mean, the open letter and the pamphlet were used by the early Congress leaders in their agitations. The pamphlet, for instance, was a very effective means of communication in those days. And uh, it could be really dated back to what we I mean, we can date back to Tom Paine's political rights and the 1790s. I mean, the pamphlet were at several levels. I mean, it's it, it shorter, and it was shorter, it was easier to read than a book or even perhaps a newspaper. It I mean, you, you, I mean uh, it could be easily disseminated as it was cheap. I mean, it turns a repression, a pamphlet, uh, and the very act of its possession itself becomes a symbol of defiance. I mean, this, for instance, is to be found in the case of something called the Green Pamphlet, uh, which Gandhi brought with him from South Africa in 1896, and which listed the grievances faced by Indians in South Africa. I mean, owing to its green color, it came to be known as Green Pamphlet. I mean, this pamphlet was sold out at its first meeting in India, and thereafter, several editions of it were brought out. And the more the government tried to address it, the more popular it became. 
called this brand of journalism is different. I mean, it may be at best referred as a boxy journalism. Because when we talk about journalism, we never try to recreate it and study what are the different ways and strands we can analyze a journalism. I mean, sometimes it becomes extremely misleading. Gandhi is a journalist. That's the context which we see. In fact, this referred as a box seizure. Gandhi highlighted about Hindus with amity, Indian independence, Indian indentured labourers in South Africa, and ever more about equality. He started a newspaper, a newspaper to depict the conditions of indentured labourers. I mean, the South African authorities did not make a distinction between the labor and the profession. I mean, in 1903, Gandhi started his first newspaper, a weekly in English and Gujarati title, Indian Opinion. I mean, in Delhi, by the autumn of 1903, he began covering the nation's political and indentured workers. In its first 11 years, Indian Opinion would have 196 separate articles. Three, I mean, the boxy journalist, and I best describe this name, is practically helpless. He comes from India in order to avoid starving. Keep them in a public eye. He was setting the agenda in the South African press. But Gandhi took his movement to India, the nation cause shifted to that of the wonderful obligations and equality state near the top of his journalistic career. Similarly, the open letter addressed to the authorities, I mean, which began by informing people about the latest problems in the dances, served two purposes. First, it addressed the authorities. Second, it educated people about their decisions. On this Swedesi exhibition in 1923, after the withdrawal of the non-cooperation movement, illustrates the power of speaking and leaving. It also provided a unique platform for people across the country to compete uh, and blind shelter and the phenomenal sources of the Sudesi exhibition in 1923 was also visited by a large lack of people and thereafter it also became a great crowd for them in the following year. So as one of the historians like Lisa Trivedi would say that this became also a visual means of communication which transcended language. It also explains the centrality of Chalka, the concept of Sudesi himself. Now they use several such visual symbols to communicate and convey this philosophy. Even the burning of foreign world can be seen as yet another visual symbol. The Gandhi and Kali movement responded to the Olympic challenge, not merely at the level of economies and culture, but also providing alternatives to the colonial science and from the system at each and every unit. I mean, one of the primary objectives of Kali movement was to revive what we the household and spinning by challenging the notion of what we call inferiority of Indian cotton I mean, for this, the Kali movement had to look at the alternative indigenous crops. I mean, the response of the Kali movement was not one of culture only, but a very much a technological one too. I mean, talking about the sense of the scientific Okay. Gandhi once remarked, no science had dropped from the skies in the perfect form. All sciences developed and are built to experience. The spinning wheel was very soon created as a symbol of loyalty and an image to reflect two nationalist spirit by Gandhi leaders. I mean, it was a symbol of identification of Congress leaders. I mean, the regional leaders often circulated their photographs depicting quite prominently the Chalka, Gandhian cap, and the Kali dress. The Kali campaign sought to divide Indians into two classes. I mean, those who believed in it, and old Kali, and those who did not. However, Gandhi's class division was enforced non violently, but it was not entirely free of coercion. It provided an opportunity for passage from one class to another. His emphasis on non violence was intended. I went back to provide a possibility for the transformation of an individual's political life. 
very cutting. In that sense, was a transformative experience. One could change one's class affiliation through personal conviction and a change of what we call of the heart. I mean, Khadi became an ideological symbol on which one's political and personal beliefs could be taken. One's clothing became an index for one's political affiliation. A formal recognition of the choice regarding clothes did not arise as an actual outcome of Khadi. The dilemma of choosing Khadi or other clothes was a post to a sustained campaign. Khadi's course and Piantex lay in the projected as a commodity of colonial resistance. In refurbishing Charaka, there was the use of tradition, but the new reinvented Charaka was put in the service of modern carrier of import substitution. Khadi gradually transformed itself into a political capital. A wearer of Khadi became in the eyes of authority a rebel. A Khadi's transformation from clothing to political uniform kept the clothing character. It became a commodity of conscious choice. The ideological investment in Kabi enhanced the character of the cloth. My presentation there would like to say that it engages with some of the core issues of communication that we concern from Gandhian writings and contributions. So as to develop a starting point for any creative engagement with Indian communities. And then it brings to the questions of knowledge, practice, and strategies of communication. And finally, relevance of Gandhian communication in the present era. I mean, any discussion of the knowledge of communication in Indian society needs to address these key attributes that contributes to the formation of communication and the constitution of Indian society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Das, and uh, that was indeed uh, a most uh, perceptive uh, presentation on Gandhi as a communicator. And I think from uh, the insights that you've given us from, from the intellectual history of communication, uh, we really understand that Gandhi was a very, very different type of communicator. He was no ordinary communicator at all, and his communication was very, very purposive, very, very strategic, and this is one uh, thought that I uh, will stay back with me is that Gandhi was not a theoretician, his life itself was a message. You know, so uh, he did not communicate only through his writings or through his speeches or through his letters uh, or through his own brand of uh, advocacy journalism or you know through uh, uh, the book uh, Him Swaraj, where he really, you know, his thoughts and his views on Swaraj and modern civilization is crystallized. Uh, but also he really uses it with great effect to, uh, you know, actually communicate to the people, you know, that without rejecting Western civilization, it's impossible for uh, people to uh, fulfill this dream of freedom. So his uh, brand of communication was indeed uh, a model for any communicator to learn from. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful speech. and. Uh, if we have uh, you know, permission from the uh, uh, webinar director, I think we can go ahead with the uh, question and answer session. Yes, I do want to go ahead with the question and answer session. Yes, we go ahead with the Q&A session. Okay, thank you. Uh, So I'll start off with this uh, question uh, and uh, probably I would like to direct it to Dr. Uh, Pulikin. So uh, this is from uh, Jimmy Campbell Talk and uh, uh, he wants to uh, know uh, what was Gandhiji's uh, take on the partition of India because uh, it is often seen that uh, uh, people uh, have Question, uh, you know, Gandhi's uh, uh, like uh, yeah, there are lots of pictures and articles on Gandhi which try to frame him as the person who is responsible for the partition itself. So, uh, could you enlighten us a little on what was Gandhi's uh, take on the partition? Not to go Yes. <clears throat> I think that in a, in a 
have to throw that question that we all know. Everybody knows that Gandhi was sacred in the partition of India. And in the final decision that uh, took that, that day, Gandhi was, it was his bound day. So Gandhi was writing, writing all the time of the, the, the statements that the other people are raising. Gandhi was writing, 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 and rejecting the idea. And uh, Gandhi's compromise was going to fail just because of the political ambition of of the, the Indian leaders, I should say that. Especially at that time when the economic formula of making Jinnah as the president of India, everything, everything will be settled and the partition would not have happened. And uh, attacking Gandhi for the partition, this type of allegations. The intention is to make them popular in some, in some way or the other way. If I am doing some good things in our country, for 50, for 50 years or 20 years or 25 years, I, I won't be in the news. I won't get any public attention. If I am criticizing Gandhi in a severe manner, I will get a good price and publicity. At, a, at, a, at any way. This for I am taking an example the role so in not now but at the book. For winner. Big Gandhi that Gandhi was against in the in the Gandhian uh, uh, people. So just put the that that attack. And in the day, Roy became very popular, very, uh, you know, very person who is having a very uh, high gross value within our, within our ways. So that is just for getting getting gross value and uh, publicity. That's uh, that's the simple thing. And uh, almost everybody making all the allegations. They all know that what Gandhi is. Okay. Uh, there's another question which I would again direct at Dr. Uh, Kulikan. So uh, you have spoken about the uh, the various balances uh, you know, that uh, Gandhi talks about in terms of uh, creating a balance in the society. So uh, there's a question from Udit Kukoi that are these uh, balances feasible in reality? Is it possible to uh, actually create and uh, have these kind of balances in today's society. We are, we are all people thinking that we all have a uh, have an equal opportunity to live in this society. If we are having that opinion to give the the free chance of living in this society, then it is feasible. And if you are going to have a 5% people's mandate, then it is not feasible at all. And uh, so those people, those, those who are living except outside the you know, 5% uh, population group, facing the very rich people, all the others are having, facing the same problem that they are not denying the, the opportunities in whatever way in the field. So if you are going to have that type of attitude, developing that type of attitude, it is possible. Otherwise, in a society just like in a political capturing society, it is a problem. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there is a question from uh, Abhishek Kabra and uh, I would uh, probably request uh, uh, Professor Das to take this question. So the question is, uh, the Gandhian view of Ram Rajya talked about just and equitable society and uh, said that the society should be one where there is no difference between prince and the pauper. But at present time, looking at the inequitable development of our country, 
How do you see his views of Ram Rajya's practical relevance and chances of implementation? Or is it that it had just become a token for the state to use the term Ram Rajya and associate the same with the Gandhi's beliefs and use it to defend attack on minorities? I think, uh, I think it's not about, let's not uh, look at it in a very partisan sense about Ram Rajya. It's about, you, you need to understand the use of metaphor. Use of language and I mean, you have to uh, deconstruct Gandhian writings. I mean, uh, Gandhi uses, Gandhi appropriates metaphor from our religious uh, texts and so trying to overarch and give it, that doesn't mean that Gandhi is at all. Anyway, I mean, any sense of in that sense, a very strong, uh, a good goal, subscribing to any specific which is what we I mean, Gandhi is sort of trying to play with that kind of a language and metaphor. And it, it reminds me of the autobiography um, uh, I mean, uh, Louis Fisher. I mean, Louis Fisher writes and uh, says that the most uh, uh, what we call uh, uh, religious man become, become the father of a secular nation and the most secular man became a father of a religious nation. That is Jinnah. Jinnah was a very secular man. Because the, the way they break the language, the way they use the language, Jinnah was outright. The issue is that Gandhi wanted to reinvent. You see, the question is our process of invention and reinvention of it. How we use, let's not go by its implications in the context and we look at it. I mean, there is some interesting question somewhere it was asked. That uh, it's a very interesting question when I was going through the meeting details. And I found a very interesting question somebody had asked that how, in the present context, are these used? That probably is the most a striking question that we have looked at. Gandhi is appropriated in the present context. How Gandhi is appropriated, we need to critically analyze and see. I mean, Gandhi, we can't live because we have nothing else. We, 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 we are in a vacuum or in a vacuous state if Gandhi is not there, because at least somebody is there to fall back upon. And even think about you know, Gandhi is there, I am mean, behind, behind myself. So you know, for me, something is there. So that is the issue that when we talk about, we try to be in that. Probably one of the mistakes and wonder we have done in the past history that we have too much against Gandhi within a Western Premise of what you call enlightenment and modernity. Gandhi always contested that. Gandhi tried to reappropriate and try to counter that. And Gandhi trying to, Gandhi never wanted to get into a binarism. Gandhi is completely out of this whole race. Gandhi is trying to reinvent and put it in a different way. So we need to think about that our social science, if we want to develop the Gandhi engagement. It's not about isolating Gandhi. It has to be a continuous engagement. And that, that is where we need to show that, look, this is what our Gandhi way, an indigenous way of understanding. The problem is, in our communication and social science research, I would rather say that how many of you, how many of us, I mean, whenever we try to read any material, immediately we go to Google and try to drop down all the material. And that we see, we do not see at all what are the Indian writings. Because somebody will laugh at you. You are doing research in India and you do not look at your indigenous material and you always look at the Western material. How do you know that those Western materials they do not connect with your society, they do not connect with your culture? But no matter you deliberately impose those ideas to your uh, definition, your PhD work and your article, you do not realize, you do not fit in. First, you need to look at your own indigenous quality. First, you need to look at your own indigenous material, because we have never done it. That's why our scholarship is extremely helpful. I mean, there are discussions about de-westernizing Gandhi from the very beginning has been talking about this whole notion of critiquing this de-westernization. Gandhi is talking in 1930. It's not today. Gandhi is talking in the 1930s about this whole imperialistic idea. I mean, it's a mindset. 
if we do not connect to each other, if we do not know each other, if I do not know your work, what is you are doing in writing for Tati, and I read your work and I try to extend it, we have done that. But we feel very happy, five foreign authors, and at the end of the day, you will see that there's a good piece of all. But that is where we have had property of this entire scholarship, and that is what Tati is very particular. When the, he, he is, you cannot fit Gandhi within that frame. Gandhi is completely out of it. And now, if you want to engage, you need to indigenously engage with your scholarship. Then you counter, then you talk. Because we need to understand if we say that soft power, if we say that Indian way, what is an Indian way? I mean, what is an Indian way? How do you justify an Indian way? Can there be an Indian way? I mean, Brahmanism gives an explanation. There are different eight ways of talking about Indian way. And Allah was a great point. He has written, can there be an Indian way of thinking? Can there be an Indian way of thinking? It's one of the most brilliant articles. I mean, what should we? He says that can there be an Indian way of thinking? So now is the time that we need to engage with our indigenous scholars. Should more and more contribute, more work on it, either as they call Jatiba Kule. There are there are alternatives. So people should work. I mean, otherwise, who will, people will laugh in your communication. After a point, they will laugh at you. Because I remember when I began my career, I am a self friend man on communication. I never had any formal training. I used to go to IMC Library. It used to take me time to digest those terms, which is used in Clapper, Burlo. I mean, I was struggling to you know, digest those terms. I mean, these are so alien. You look to me one way, I mean, terms. I mean, they do not feel. I do not feel comfort to connect with those terms, but we have imposed those categories. And today we have thrown it. The entire modern life requires everything we need to understand. It's such a vibrant India, it's such a vibrant society. We have never realized that what are the richness of communications here. We never thought about working on our own indigenous culture. So it is just the beginning. We need to engage how can the Indian way of engaging. I'm no more impressed with any Western PK. I mean, they do not fit into our system. I mean, I'm no more impressed with that. We need to work with our own indigenous tradition, with our own society, our own culture, history. And that is where Gandhi gives me an entry point. Every time students ask you, what about the indigenous culture? There is no, there is no Indian contributions. There is no Indian writings. There is no Indian concept, there is no Indian ethics. So that is where Gandhi, I began, that is when I was completely frustrated with such questions. Then I thought that probably we need to start working on indigenous. Now, I think a lot of people have been working on Ambedkar, some people are working on Pune. So, future, like coming 10 years, 20 years, because if you want to build a knowledge base, we need to work on the indigenous. Then, I think that the question doesn't arise. Is this an Amaraji? Why not? What is wrong with Amaraji? What is wrong with Amaraji? How the concepts are used? I mean, Gandhi is using in a metaphorical sense. Gandhi uses all their terms, as I said about idiomatic expressions. He has always appropriated these idioms. Now, somebody asked me, Gandhi, I mean, I said, somebody has asked me that Gandhi is a journalist. I said that Gandhi is not. He did a lot of advocacy. And some others would say that Gandhi was a, he was a great interpersonal communicator. I mean, I, I totally disagree with him. I totally disagree. This is where we codify Gandhi. Gandhi, Gandhi is a much more Gandhi is a much more Gandhi. You can't just define Gandhi by saying he's a great interpersonal. It must be a joke. I mean, uh, uh, you go back to 1948, there was an article by the in the uh, journal of communication who wrote. So the government is fixing very well with the Western Java. This is a very well with the Western Java. I strongly condemn such kind of writing. We fix it all because you send them when you write in the journal such kind of article that they can be happy and they are And so that they can not realize what is Gandhi's potential. I mean, we have to develop this whole slavic mindset. I mean, we are talking about doing this tonight. Is that by writing Gandhi as a great interpersonal? He communicated with him. He visited him. That's why he took him. 
international, I think this will be this communication and international. This is the flaw of American communication scholarship right in the early 90s. I have a lot of witnessing all these growth of scholarship. I know that in 1985, onwards, there's a major shift in American scholarship. Otherwise, it is extremely hollow and completely based on an economic condition, they nothing, and that is why the family has been It's the fact that we need to engage, talk about money, and think about our scholars, think about our feedbacks. Because in other disciplines, they have Indian political thought, Indian sociological thought, and they have been talking about it in different ways. But we never engage because we have not contributed. We have not contributed. We have to do a lot of research. It's a collective responsibility across the regions people should work. I mean, people should work on different kinds of movement. India is a big society in terms of the communication and the culture, the diversity. I mean, people learn from us rather than we go and die. I mean, communication is a thing. Then we have much to offer rather than what we pick up these kind of concepts and theories. I have my differences. And I, 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 I'm convinced about what I'm saying. And I know because you know, Indian is there an Indian way of engaging? This is the time we need to work about can there be an Indian way of engaging with the issues rather than always selling and propagating what it will. Uh, somebody has asked about journalism. I mean, today in the US, today in the US, they're laughing at journalism as a theme. They're saying that journalism is another form of ism. Journalism is another form of ism. And they are surprised to know that how journalism, as I said earlier, which was brewed in England, matured in America, exported all over the world, and people, people have appreciated those ideas. And still they are continuing with that idea of journalism. And that's the point today. People are critiquing the idea of journalism, which we haven't always upholding. Today, they are laughing that we are still continuing with journalism. Because we have never seriously engaged. Now, Gandhi, Gandhi probably will look back to this whole idea of uh, uh, the, the, what, what the Green Conflict is a big enough. I will find that Gandhi worked on what we call peace journalism. Gandhi worked on what we call an advocacy journalism. When the world was yet to get into an advocacy, Gandhi did well. How many scholars would contribute by saying that Gandhi was, his brand of journalism was a box journalism? Because we have been so obsessed with sensational journalism, we never look at what we call an advocacy journalism. This is time. Only when you talk about justice, media justice. And that is why we need to work more and more. And in the future, then we can contribute immensely to the community. Otherwise, it has no meaning. And it's a time, all of you are, I mean, there is a promising potential, and it's an idea that must go the start. And that is my actually interest about the film. It's not, I mean, taking Gandhi, then we should have an anchor somewhere, and when the anchor moves around, and this is an anchor we need to work, Gandhi gives you that anchor to bridge. And we must more work on it. People have been working on different aspects of Gandhi. Whether it is Gandhi's return, the film, I mean, there are different aspects the scholars have been working on Gandhi. So, on the other hand, the industry works are of today, the future you will find that these are the Thank you. Thank you, Professor Das. Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Riti Kapil. Uh, she uh, wants to know about. Uh, Gandhiji's thoughts on women in emancipation. So uh, she said that as a female student, uh, Gandhi's writings never really seemed uh, liberative for her. So uh, she said that Gandhi has been criticized on several occasions by historians, such as Judith Brown, for confirming women's dependent position by his use of traditional Hindu models of femininity. Gandhi has been criticized for encouraging women to play public roles distinct of men, but not in competition of men. So, uh, I think uh, uh, it would be nice if both the panelists could share uh, a little uh, on this. I, I have no idea, because I'm not a Scandian scholar per se. I just work on media and communication from that point of view. 
I don't want to uh, make any comment, but I don't know much about Gandhi's uh, control. There is one, uh, there is one uh, uh, statement I would like to share. Probably Gandhi writes in my statement. Gandhi writes that the guilt which he carries, the guilt which he carries about sexuality, the guilt which he carries. When his father was dying, when he was when his father was dying, and he was having sex with his wife, when he was having sex with his wife, and his father was dying, but he could not go to the and that guilt he carried throughout his life. That probably he made it, he made a kind of self abstinence, but also made in a way a self abstinence, and which he wanted to practice on himself. That is probably this is. My understanding about the I don't know what's the Kami's take on women's issue. Sorry. I think perhaps you can can that. I like you. Yes. I'm having one of them. Dr. Bulikan, would you like to please uh, show a little light on this? No, no, sir. I am not having any comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we'll take one last question now. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, this is a question from uh, Rajesh Das, uh, who asked this uh, that Gandhiji and his ideologies reads about non violence and the spiritualization of politics. But this modern, advanced, techno based, and commercialized society. Violence can best be answered by violence or multiples of violence. And subaltern communities are brutally dominated and suppressed by the powerful bloc of the country. On the other side, India is emerging as a military superpower with advanced weapons. So, this uh, humanity is really speaking that Ahimsa, Parma, Dharma. So, uh, Dr. Kulikan, uh, could you kindly take this uh, question and uh, this would be the last question for the evening. We have several questions but then unfortunately because of the paucity of time, uh, we won't have time for addressing all the questions. I really apologize to all the participants for this. Um, but I think we can have this last, one last question answered. Dr. Kuhn, you can please. All this, all, thing, all these things happening just because of, of the power politics. The people in the society, they wanted to get in the powerful positions, they try to make the situation advantageous to each and everybody. They are political leaders, they are spiritual leaders, they are the rich people, they are the bureaucrats, and everybody, they, they, they are continuously trying to make it all the situations are going to to eat different groups that is because you know, one of those everything will be turning like this. If there is a powerful lobby point from the common people, the ordinary people is the poor and the poor people. <laughs> this is not what is having happened. Kaliki Barala. Sunday. So I think the latest absence. Is that is the problem? Okay. I I think I think, uh, I think uh, there is a tendency uh, we can we want to jump to a kind of uh, we create a crisis. Then immediately we look at uh, how Gandhi will fit into save us from the crisis. But the very beginning of this crisis, Gandhi never I Gandhi never accepted. I mean, uh, it, it's just like what Paul, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a very interesting, it's called crisis management. So you are basically trying to bring Gandhi as a good crisis manager. Suddenly there is an issue come up, so how Gandhi will give us an uh, answer, how Gandhi's answer to this Gandhi is never against, the, I mean, this whole uh, uh, arms race. Gandhi is looking totally critical of this kind of development totally. Gandhi is totally critical about the development. So Gandhi is suggesting a way to look at these developments. Today the crisis in ecology, the environment, 
you were talking about the Gandhi and the way of it is in But Gandhi was not responsible for the call, I mean, the issue which is happened in terms of the environment. Suddenly, the environment because we have followed the West. We have followed the Western model, and which we have been going on and on. And so the crisis in the world, Gandhi is not responsible. He is opposed. He is opposed. He is totally opposed. So the question is, I am not bringing Gandhi out of the way of the Gandhi. I am saying Gandhi is a big out there. How do you think? What is the easy way out? So the question is, there are the limitations. Gandhi is not saying that there is a lot of hard-faced management. You can't be done it. Well, you do a hard-faced. You can't be done it. As it's all mission. If you can't bring it on to the most of crisis, you want to bring it down and say, please help us. What kind of explanations you have, what questions So I think such kind of framing a question, framing a question itself is a problematic. But I would say that you need to rethink about your framing a question. I mean, I can't, I mean, Gandhi never. He totally disagreed with the kind of uh, the way the developments, the technologies, the whole imperialistic growth, the way, and he was totally against the kind of science of technology. So everything he did not deny it. That is where we need to understand. I mean, that is what the whole modernity is assumptions, what I said. That critique of modernity, Gandhi was critique of modernity. Modernity means we talk about a particular kind of an economy. Ecological progress, which Gandhi is critiquing, Gandhi is denying that. He said that look, these, these kind of technologies, these kind of developments will lead to a kind of a drudgery, and that is what the drudgery has created. So Gandhi is from the beginning, he lived for a long time in England. In fact, he was invited to South Africa again to be a lawyer, he went and finally he wanted to saw. So I'm saying he knows the Western world better. I mean, he knows very well the rise in the uh, growth of the Western world, obviously. And I, so today what we see about our space or the armament, what is happening in our world? Maybe that Gandhi is just a kind of a kind of a metaphor, whenever we want to use Gandhi, we have to see this new form of using it. Or Gandhi way of engaging. That is the problem. Because our, that is a problem of the crisis of because we see that's why we need to do a really serious engagement with our intellectuals. We used to talk about Gandhi, but we are not seriously venturing into Gandhi and do scholarship and what uh, Professor Politan was talking about and in schools and colleges. It's not about introducing the Gandhi in your mockery. What I'm saying is that has to be a critical engagement and Gandhi has to be nurtured I mean, what his intellectual progress. That is where you find that you are giving all the importance to your scholars, your intellectuals. That is what I suggest that our intellectuals should be brought out. More we need to bring out and critically engage with the scholars. I mean, the request, the request to the scholars. I mean, we have a very rich tradition. And we need to more and more engage with the scholars. Hey, one more thing. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. When we talk about uh, these questions, you see what Kudikar had said that Gandhi was always a practitioner. When you talk about non violence, when you talk about uh, the other theories, what you talk about Ramra here, Gandhiji never theorized these things. He only practiced, and these theoreticizations have been made later on. And Gandhi, when he talked about non violence, he practiced it during the colonial days. Now the situation has changed, the society has changed, and we live in a materialistic world. And when we talk of these things now, and you talk of relevance, you talk of the establishment of Ramaraj, how can it be possible? Now, the possible, again, it is left to us. If we believe in Gandhian principles, then we will have to rise, we will have to revolt, again, for an equitarian society. Equal, equal um, society. So we have to raise our voice. Gandhi gave voice to the voiceless. Now, we all intellectuals today, do we have a voice? If we do not have a voice, 
and raising our question of Brahmanatya in a webinar. And first let us make an introspection of it. We are problematizing the Gandhian values then. Instead of understanding the uh, values of Gandhi, instead of contextualizing them, and today is a capitalistic world, it's not a socialistic world. We have become a capitalistic world. When you talk about uh, the modernity or talk about the economic development and look at the way we dress ourselves, look at the way we um, uh, take our food, look at the way we, the migrant laborers have been um, um, dealt with by the government. Uh, where are we? Where were we? Have we ever questioned them? Why the migrant laborers were treated like that? Why they have to walk uh, thousands and thousands of miles? It's not only a matter of raising a question in a webinar. We will have to raise our voice in the society itself. When they, these are ha happening, then we will have to raise our voice. That's what Gandhi said. Gandhi never said, you remain silent to all the mistakes or mishappenings in the society and raise this in discussion forums. That's not the, uh, what Gandhi said. Gandhi said to practice, yeah. to be a voice for the voice. You see, there is uh, one thing which I want to share because, uh, because suddenly this issue comes up the way Gandhi used Ramaraja. Now, you know that uh, today your Ramaraja is literally partially coming through. And more and more debates will take place in the future years. And you will find that no scholarship will come out. As all of you must be knowing that in communication, there are different kinds of things. It will come out. But the issue is you must understand about the metaphor, the metaphor, the context yeah. in which it's being used. So let's not get in. Nobody knows what Ramaraja is. Nobody knows. Even Gandhi won't know what Ramaraja is. All of us know about Ramaraja through certain printed texts. I mean, that printed text comes to us through different ways. Now the question is now a kind of a Ramaraja, a Ramaraja, if comes tomorrow, is it going to exclude? Is it going to uh, sideline a section of people? Of course not. The question is, you need to think about making it a broad-based society. Gandhi thinks about Ramanachya maybe in the context. He thinks about it, a kingdom as an ideal team and how the society was existing, how the, it's not about communities, ethnicities, cultures. I mean, certainly we jump, we are very, very strongly against because probably that is where our whole movements have collapsed of this world. This nation is was a man of painting day by day, evolving day by day. What he said in, in his previous day, he reinterpreted in the next day. So it is our responsibility to interpret and reinterpret to suit the situations that we are facing. And uh, what Mahavadi said about the migrant laborers case and other things. And I should add, I should, uh, add one, more, one more point. The, the government of Pakistan, one of the things that we are blaming it every is Pakistan. The government of Pakistan they have reduced the diesel prices by 30 rupees during this high period in order to help the poor people in the private sector himself saying that if we are raising the prices of diesel, this is the harvest time and the poor people will suffer. And uh, what we did here in India, just see the opposite, reducing the, reducing the corporate tax by 15 percent, earlier it was 30 percent, and if we reduce it for promoting economic interest, we, we reduce it to 15 percent, and uh, to cover up the balance, we are having only one source arising the few taxes. So just to uh, uh, 
If we are if we are recording it, I am going to be in trouble. No, 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 don't worry. Don't worry, sir. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much to uh, uh, Prof. Das, uh, Prof. Kulikan, Prof. Behra and to everyone uh, for participating today and for, uh, for this very insightful discussion. I would now uh, request uh, Prof. Jaya Chakravarti, Head of the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Tejpur University to please uh, sum up uh, the discussions today and to offer the of thanks. Thank you, Anjuman. I am really amazed with the way that the discussion has gone forward. And I cannot probably thank enough uh, our two speakers today, uh, Dr. Kuligal and Professor uh, Nishadip Das, for the enriching perspective that both of you have provided. Uh, obviously, you have been highlighting again and again that we should not try to understand Gandhi within very narrow confines. But what you have probably done today is that you have uh, unfolded Gandhi uh, in as wide a perspective as possible. Both of you have discussed Gandhi in entirely two different ways, where Dr. Nikan has been talking about the life of Gandhi, how he uh, practiced his ideologies, and how probably we can probably practice them today. What is required for us? How should we take forward the ideologies of Gandhi and the relevance of his way of life into our political life, into our way of thinking, into our social activities that we take forward? The idea of governance, the idea of development, our entire social action, how probably Gandhian philosophies can inform us, can guide us in our day-to-day -day activities of how we conduct ourselves as social beings in our local context, in our national context, and as well as in the international context. That's how Dr. Kulikan has brought forward Gandhi for us. And he has made uh, Gandhi like a living personality who we can innovate. And when we look at Professor Vishwaji Das, he has been talking of Gandhi as a natural. We have, uh, and it's really so. Uh, if we look at Gandhi, we have been highlighting and saying about Gandhi as uh, uh, and the symbolism that he has used throughout his life. Uh, uh, the Jarekha, the Khadi, the burning of uh, uh, foreign goods and foreign clothes and material, uh, the Swadeshi movement. It, it has really, uh, it conveyed a great meaning at that point of time and he has been a very, very effective communicator as much as we say that we should de-Westernize our understanding of what constitutes communication, the idea of communication itself, very much so. But then, uh, all said and done, we have to accept that Gandhi was an exceptional time and how a single individual could bring together the idea of a nation of India, the, the nation that we understand today was constructed so much through the words of Gandhi, through how he made us believe about our country at that point of time. And if we look at the current context, we have seen Gandhi to himself, he has evolved as a symbol. And we have uh, in so many ways uh, commercialized Gandhi. And we are probably also interpreting Gandhi or using Gandhi for our own benefit in so many different ways. Because uh, he himself is so much of a symbol and he has probably been deconstructed with his lati and his chashma and his uh, outline. In so many ways we have also commercialized Gandhi. <coughs> so that itself tells us that uh, it is not so that Gandhi is not really, but he is, he, uh, just like he was probably involved in his thought when he was alive, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, talking again and again in new different ways, correcting his understanding. Even today I believe Gandhi is evolving amongst us and it is for us to understand in this evolving perspective. And let us really not uh, narrow it down to those narrow confines of our own personal uh, I should say self-centric interpretations of Gandhi that I want to fit Gandhi to justify this act or to critique this act. So
So let us not make Gandhi a very narrow idea of either supporting or critiquing uh, certain activities, which probably needs to be understood in a larger context of the political and cultural situation, the social situation within which we are situated now. So uh, I believe our intention in the beginning of this webinar was probably to ignite a little bit of an interest in this idea of the Gandhian philosophies and how probably our young scholars and young faculty members would want to connect to the Gandhian ideologies to Gandhi as a communicator and understand him better. Uh, that was, uh, but it is just a starting point of the discussion and I believe today the two uh, uh, speakers that we have had have done more than justice, I would say, in triggering our conferences. I believe many of our young scholars will be inspired to read more on Gandhi, his philosophies, his life, and probably even if we can invite bits and parts of it into how we read Gandhi, how we theorize, uh, and probably de westernize our understanding of, understanding of Gandhi from a very, very local perspective, uh, we would have uh, uh, probably served the purpose for which we organize. I uh, heart, uh, it's my heartfelt gratitude and thankfulness to both the speakers today for enriching this session in such a fantastic manner and an incomparable manner probably. Uh, uh, it, has, it has been so, so enriching for every one of us who have uh, interacted with you, who have listened to you. And I also thank all the participants. I believe the questions which have been posed by the participants have made this presentation so much more lively and uh, the way you have taken the discussion forward has really made it a very lively session. So I also thank all the participants who have uh, been here with us and uh, uh, to Professor Kulikan, uh, I would uh, specifically want to say that uh, sir you have come to Kohati, you have been to uh, uh, the uh, Science and Technology University of Meghalaya. Uh, you should, uh, and we will make that opportunity that you can also come and visit us at Hapur University. Professor Vishuddhi Das has been with us uh, for such a long time. We look at him as our mentor uh, in so many different ways. He has been associated with our department for such a long time, and we value your association with our department. We look forward to your continued guidance and association with our department. Uh, I also thank all my colleagues who have uh, uh, put forth uh, different sorts of efforts in putting this webinar together. Professor Mehra has been a great inspiration. Uh, our colleague uh, Manoj Deri has been hosting the webinar and is uh, to be uh, taking uh, tackling all the technical features which uh, might come during the webinar. So uh, it has been a teamwork and uh, every one of my colleagues have contributed. Uh, thank you again to everyone and I believe mean, Professor Mehra wants to say something. He has been waving his hand. Uh, but uh, personally, as well as on behalf of the department, I thank Professor Vishwajitas and uh, Dr. Kudika for the live session that we have taken today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Just I would like to add one thing. Because of what Dr. was talking about uh, commercialization of Hindi. I just like to add it. Remember in 85 when I was in the US, uh, uh, of beer was advertised. And that Budweiser beer was actually carrying a Gandhi's uh, advertisement. And it was it was said, even Mohundas Gandhi from Porbanda drinks this beer. And that was the ad which was in the US. And I imagine there was such a strong protest. There was such a strong protest in the US. And ultimately that didn't come. So that's what I'm saying. But like, Gandhi has been used in the US. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Da. Actually, you now is not yet over. There are a long list of questions. I have been over the Aminata 
Thank you. 